set enhancements. We'll then hear about utilizing FPGAs and uh, uh, lastly about an <coughs> excuse me, independent discrete accelerator. Our first speaker is Takumi Mar Maruyama. He's the Deputy General Manager of LSI Development Division, Next Generation Technical Computing Unit at Fujitsu. He's in, been involved in the development of the Spark 64 GP, Spark 5, 6, 7, and now the 8FX. He earned his BE in Mathematical Engineering and Instrumentation Physics from the University of Tokyo, and uh, he'll now be speaking to us about the Spark 8FX, OctoCore. Takumi? Hi, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Takumi Mariama from Fujitsu. Today, I would like to introduce Fujitsu's next generation quad core processor, Spark 64 8FX. Here is our Spark 64 processor roadmap. Spark 64 is the name of the processor series developed by Fujitsu to be used for Unix and technical computing servers. Spark 64 6 and 7 have been used in Spark Enterprise servers sold by Fujitsu and Sun. Also, Spark, uh, Spark 64 7 is used in Fujitsu's technical computing server, FX1. And now, we have newly developed the uh, processor called Spark 64 8 FX for petascale computing. First, let me talk about the design philosophy of the processor. High gigaflops, high efficiency, and low power consumptions are key features in processors of supercomputers. As initial design of the processor, we made a lot of performance evaluation and concluded that we had to significantly enhance this original Spark V9 architecture found in Spark 64 processors. I will show you the detail of ISA enhancement starting from the next slide. Also, high integration and high reliabilities are important features. Especially, I'd like to point out that high reliability, high reliability is essential for supercomputers because petascale supercomputer requires more than 10,000 processors in it. Also, we would like to reuse Spark, existing Spark 647 design whenever applicable to reduce design time and cost. Spark 648 FX complies with the Spark V9 standard and J uh, joint programmer specification co-developed by Fujitsu and Sun. That means Spark 48 FX is designed to be software compatible with the existing Spark 4 processors. And also, we have implemented uh, the new instruction set extensions called HPCAs, High Performance Computing Arithmetic Computer Extensions. You can download the ISA manuals of Spark 48FX uh, from Fujitsu's website. It's free. There are, three, uh, there are three documents on the web. The last one is encrypted in Japanese, but we will publish the English version very soon. Now, let me talk about the various features of HPC Ace. The first one is a large register set. We have increased the number of the integer registers from 160 to 192 in HPC ACE, and from 32 to 256 floating point registers. The first 160 60 integer registers were 32 floating, uh, 32 floating point registers are the same as in Spark V9. 
for the integer register, uh, registers are configured as a Spark V9 register windows, except the extended ones. That means 32 plus 32 integer registers can be accessed without changing the register window. For the floating point register side, it is to be noted that the registers are flat. What I meant to say is all the floating point registers can be accessed with the non simdo instructions as well as the simdo instructions, unlike the conventional simdo registers. The large register sets are useful for compiler to extract more parallelism currently limited by the number of the small number of the architectural registers. Please see the diagram in here. Software is able to execute the loop in parallel with loop unloading and the software pipelining as long as there are enough architectural registers available. Also, large register sets will reduce the overhead of spill and fail. One of the difficulties in implementing large register sets is how to specify the register fields in an instruction to support 256 floating point registers for FMA instruction. You need 8 bits by 4 register number fields in an instruction, while the length of the Spark V9 instruction is limited to 32 bits. To solve this issue, we have defined a new prefix called instruction called SX, SXAL. The SX, SXAL instruction writes an immediate detail to the extended, extended arithmetic register, where a register keeps the upper three bits of the source of plans or destination of plans of the subsequent one or two instructions. The second feature of HPC ACE is similar, uh, similar floating point instruction. One similar floating point instruction can execute two single precision or double precision operations. For FMA, one similar FMA instruction can execute two floating point multiply and two floating point add operations. Similar load store instruction accesses two contiguous data in memory. Data alignment requirement for the double precision single load is 8 byte rather than 16 byte to give more flexibility to the compiler. Also, since floating point registers are flat, as you can see in here, two independent floating point instructions can be combined into a single similar floating point instructions. It's instead of defining a new open calls for each similar instruction, the SXAL instructions, as explained, is used to specify a similar operation of the subsequent one or two instructions. The similar instruction gives compiler an opportunity to, to, to do the additional code optimizations. That third feature of HPC ACE is kind of interesting. It supports floating point trigonometric functions. Here is a Taylor series approximation of sine. We have defined a new instruction called FTRIMAD, which executes execute a series step by step. The instruction, uh, instruction multiplies the result of the previous result. And uh, 
square of the input, uh, input x and then add the appropriate coefficient. The performance improvement due to this instruction is significant. Spark 64HFX is able to execute sine or cosine function almost seven times faster than previous Spark 47. The fourth feature is a software controlled cache. The basic idea is very simple, but effective. The idea is to give software ability to control cache to optimize performance like a local memory while keeping the cache coherency. Software divides the cache into two groups, sector zero and sector one. Sector zero is used for instruction fetch and normal operand accesses. The sector one is reserved for operand access, explicitly specified by the software through the SXR instruction I mentioned. Also, software is able to specify the size of the sector zero and sector one through the configuration register. If your application does the data streaming and you'd like to avoid cache uh, cache pollution from, story, from the streaming data, you can assign the sector one to that data. Data in sector zero won't be affected. Or if you have a certain data, if you want to have a certain data resident in cache, you can, you can assign sector one for this. Instruction fetch and other data access occurs in sector zero, and that data in sector one will not be replaced. From hardware implementation point of view, each cache line keeps the sector information. When a cache miss occurs, the line to be replaced is chosen so that the ratio of sector zero and sector one is maintained as much as possible in addition to the regular LRU algorithm. There are many other features in HPC ACE. Conditional, conditional instructions have been added to HPC ACE to execute if loop more efficiently by removing the conditional branches. Also, floating point reciprocal, recipro reciprocal approximation of divide and square root operations have been added. The accuracy of approximation is eight bits. By using the instruction sequence in here, Spark 64HX, 8FX is able to execute divide operation almost 4.3 times faster than the previous factory for seven processes. Also, floating point minimum and maximum instructions have been added. In addition to HPC ACE architecture I mentioned, Spark 64.8FX hardware has shared L2 cache to avoid for sharing and hardware, mechanism, hardware barrier mechanism for fast core intercore synchronization. Also, Fujitsu has a compiler technology to extract parallelism from a given program automatically. By combining these features, users can treat the eight core Spark 4 8 FX as a single fast CPU. In other words, users Users do not have to be aware of eight cores to write a program. Fujitsu's compiler takes care of it. Think about the code optimization of nested, uh, nested loops. Spark 64 HFX and uh, Fujitsu compiler 
is able to execute the root inner loop I on multiple cores thanks to the shared electric cache and the hardware value mechanism, unlike the conventional scalar processes. Now, let me talk about the first chip which implements HPC ACE. This is a die photo of Spark 64-8FX. The chip includes eight identical cores and five megabyte shared LC cache. The chip also embeds memory controller, which is connected to directly to DDR3 DIMM memory with peak throughput of 64 gigabytes per second. The chip is fabricated with Fujitsu's 45 nanometer CMOS technology. The die size is 510 square millimeter and 760 million transistors are included. It runs as fast as 2 gigahertz and peak throughput is 128 gigaflops. It consumes 58 power on average with water cooling. Water cooling is beneficial to decrease leakage power and increase hard reliability. This is the die photo of Spark 64H processor core. Instructions are fetched from the L1 I cache and decoded in the instruction control unit and sent to the execution unit, or if the instruction is a load of instruction, then sent to the D1 cache. The execution unit has four FMA and 256 floating point architecture resistors, as I explained, and 48 by two floating point rename resistors. The size of L1 I cache and L1 D cache is the same, 32 kbyte two-way. Now, let me talk about the core pipelines. This is a pipeline di diagram of the previous processor, Spark 647. Then, here is a core pipeline of Spark 64-8 effects. As you see, the basic structure of the pipeline is very similar between the two. That means we have reused a lot of uh, design of Spark 47 to, to develop Spark 48 FX. But there are some differences. The red portion highlights these differences. First of all, duplication in the architectural resistors have been removed because Spark 48 FX does not support the hardware match threading. Instead, the number of architectural resistors have been increased dramatically, as I explained. Also, number of the floating point exec execution units has been increased from two to four. And now it includes a memory controller to reduce memory latency. There are some changes in the pipeline. First, at the issue stage, we have added a new stage called PD. Which, which is pretty decoded between the E stage and D stage. Six instructions, are read, uh, including the two SX, SXR instructions, are read from instruction buffer and packed at the B stage and sent to the decoder. The packed instructions have extended register fields as well as the simul operation attributes. And four packed or six unpacked instructions can be committed at the same time to maintain the issue rate. Also, at the execution stage, B stage to read the register file has been split into two. The first B stage is used to access the floating point register. The second B stage is used to exchange the data from, uh, from basic side and extend its side to realize flat floating point register file. 
and or complex operations. Now, let me talk about the performance of the chip. This result shows the performance of the Spark T48F processor core. Please note that the results are harder measured. That means the chip is real. It is up and running the lab. The vertical line shows the execution time relative to Spark T47 running at 2.5 gigahertz. Horizontal lines are, are split into three benchmarks, divide, sign, and ninth degree polynomial, respectively. For the each, bar, each benchmark, there are three bars. The th first bar is for Spark 247, and the last two are for the Spark 648FX. As you see, the most of the execution time of Spark 247 is used by the stall time due to execution unit busy. This time has been reduced to almost zero on Spark 348FX. As a result, the chip is able to execute the divide operation 4.3 ti times faster than the previous processor. The performance improvement on Spark T4 uh, on a sign function is even greater, 6.8 6 times. The results on the third benchmark is not so impressive compared with the first two. This is because this particular benchmark can be highly optimized, even with the 32 floating point resistors Spark T4 7 has. Here are more, more performance results. Unlike the previous slides, this graph shows chip level performance of Spark T4 8FX. Again, as you see, lot of execution time of Spark T4 7 is used as a stall time due to execution unit busy, which has been reduced to almost zero on Spark T4 Spark City for eight effects. This is the effect of HPC ACE architecture. Overall, Spark City for eight effects runs 2.5 times faster than Spark City for seven with this application, despite its lower frequency. I expect that the performance improvement versus Spark City for seven is going to be three times with future compiler optimizations. Now, here is what future holds for Spark 64 processors. This graph shows the performance and power cons consumption of each Spark 64 processors. For Spark 64 5, 6, and 7, we have increased the performance of the processors with high processor frequency and much core, much set designs. But power consumption gets increased as well. Spark 64 8FX is the first processor for us to increase the performance by three times while decreasing the power into half. We believe that high performance and low power is going to be more important in future processor designs. Now, let me summarize of my talk. Spark 64 8 FX has been designed to be used for supercomputer for the petascale computing age. HPC instruction sets have overcome the limitation of conventional Spark V9 architecture. Spark 64-8FX has combined high performance and low power. The chip is up and running in the lab. And finally, let me repeat the exact, exact sentence I made at the last hot chip conference. 
Fujitsu will continue to develop Spark 64 processors to meet the needs of a new era. Thank you very much. Thank you. The session is now open for questions. If you would uh, have a question, please come down to one of the microphones, state your name and affiliation. Uh, Ramesh, synopsis. Mm -hmm. uh, do you expose the uh, cache uh, sector information to uh, a programmer through your Fortran compiler? Yes. Uh, the, the sectors uh, can be accessed through the non-privileged software. Also, we do have a mode which uh, determines whether it can be accessed by the non privileged software or not, which uh, the mode itself can be controlled only by the supervisor software. Okay, Kuchi Pistado Nakamura. Uh, Fujitsu is joining the Japanese government uh, project, Tempe uh, Props. And uh, so far as I hear you, uh, you probably the, I find some improvement of uh, Fujitsu CPUs. But to uh, reach the tempered uh, scale HPC, uh, HPC mm -hmm. maybe uh, probably you have a uh, lot of a gap in speed uh, in addition to uh, power consumption. So I wonder how you could build up the tempered scale uh, supercomputers using, the, for example, such as uh, chips. Well, I'm not sure that uh, whether it is allowed for me to talk about the 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 temperature the temperature props systems that you've mentioned. Generally, the process the the Spark 485 processors are connected to each other with another the chip for the interconnect, and they work together to achieve the ten, uh, temperature flops. The processor itself is a, uh, nothing but a spark uh, effect processor I mentioned. I think you have uh, still uh, some issues to build up such a temperature props. Mm, are you talking about the where efficiency of the processor or perform, uh, from performance point of view or power consumption? Well, how to say? Mm, as I meant the as I presented in the, uh, in the presentation, so far, the performance of Spark 8 FX chip is as expected. So I, I think that we can achieve the temp temperature flops with that particular system as well. Uh, Bill Rash, uh, Intel Corporation. I have two questions. Um, you mentioned you uh, improved the performance three times and you reduced the power 50% mm -hmm. from the previous generation. Mm -hmm. That's very impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you achieve that? Well, <laughs> first, we have the, the increase in the number of the, the floating point execution engine by four times and the decrease of the frequency from 2.5 gigahertz to 2 gigahertz. That the, 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 that the source of the performance improvement of three times. From the power consumption, basically we have made a lot of the clock gating to control the, the to, to remove the, the extra power as much as we can. And also water cooling, cooling contributes to the low power consumption as well. But usually when you're running floating point programs, mm -hmm. you're running most of your chip. You need most of your chip working to deliver the data flows and such. So clock gating often does not help as much when you're running a full activity type of benchmark. Mm, not necessary. For, uh, for example, for the DGM or impact benchmark, uh, the, it would use a lot of the, the, the say that the floating point uh, multiply art engine are almost very busy. But load store unit, especially the access to the LC cache or the memory memory, is not busy as the one the not as busy as execution engine. So we can save some power. Okay. Um, 
must have been a lot of power on the side to be removed. Mm -hmm. My uh, second question is the uh, you you described your increase in memory bandwidth mm -hmm. from the Spark sixty four seven. Mm -hmm. You said nothing about the increase of coherency bandwidth going from the seven to the eighth generation. What can you say about improving the coherency bandwidth to coherency. do uh, multiprocessing? Well, how to say it? the Spark sixty four eight FX? is uh, the, the meant for the single processor system. So there's no need for the coherency. Okay, it's a single processor, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, Joe Watson from Oklahoma Christian University. Uh, you described how conditional branches mm -hmm. can be removed. Are you also using branch prediction, and if so, what strategy are you using? Yeah, basically we do the user, the branch uh, prediction scheme, the using the, the Table called branch history table. It obeys a kind of standard two bit uh, 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 conventional branch predictor. And we, we also combine a certain kind of history based uh, branch predictor, which is called Light Global History Table. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Tony Brewer. He's the co-founder and CTO of Convey Computer Corporation. He's previously worked also at Hewlett Packard and Convex Computer Corporation. He earned his uh, bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering from Purdue, and he'll now be speaking to us about hybrid general purpose FPGA uh, computing systems. Thank you, Bevan, and good morning. As uh, Bevan said, the uh, presentation is about the Convey HC1 computer, specifically about the instruction set innovations that were done. Although since this computer system, I assume, is new to most people here, I'll be spending a reasonable amount of time up front going over that uh, architecture. But before I jump into this, let me give a introduction to Convey Computer. So Convey is a second round venture-based uh, startup company. The first round closed in mid-2007, and the second round just closed a uh, couple of months ago. The product is now in beta. It is at uh, customers being tested, and the production units will be, begin shipping within the next couple of weeks. Currently, staffing is at 36 people, and the uh, company is located in Richardson, Texas. It is a venture-based uh, startup company. We have four venture capital investors. First one is uh, InterWest Partner. They led the first round, and they are located just down the street here in Menlo Park. Second is CenterPoint. They're located in Dallas. Rowe Ventures in New York. And Braemar Energy led the uh, second round, and they're located in Boston. We also have two industrial investors. Uh, one is Intel Capital, and the second is Xilinx. So the presentation outline, first I'll go do an overview of the HC1 system. So you have a framework of understanding the instruction set innovations that were needed to provide a applications, uh, application specific instruction set to be able to load those into the FPGAs. And then I'll go over a few examples of uh, applications. So this is a uh, block diagram or rather a uh, diagram of the system at a very high level. We have a Intel based processor that is the host for the system. And then we have a coprocessor, a hybrid core coprocessor, that is the, uh, does the uh, data parallelism part. We have application-specific personalities that are loaded into that coprocessor. Being an FPGA, we can load that into the coprocessor. And we define a personality as a set of instructions. So these are application-specific instructions. What I've shown there is five different uh, sets of instructions that uh, have been considered and are able to be loaded into the coprocessor. A key distinction here is that both the host processor and the coprocessor are instruction-based. And so instead of um, compiling a, or doing a translation of C to Verilog, we actually predefine these personalities. So Convey develops these personalities, these sets of instructions, so that the, compi so that the customer can do a compile and run kind of uh, program model, a development model. We have tightly integrated the host processor and the coprocessor using a cache coherent shared virtual memory. 
So both the x86 processor and the coprocessor can use a load store model and not have to worry about where that data is coming from. And so we do not have to explicitly copy the data between the host memory and the coprocessor memory. Because of this tight coupling and because of the instruction-based aspects, we can use a compiler. Half of the development team is software, and a large part of that is uh, the compiler team that is able to compile uh, ANSI standard C, C++, and Fortran applications and compile that to this uh, system so that you can then run the application. So let me take a second here and contrast this to what we heard yesterday from uh, Jen Sung Wong on the uh, NVIDIA coprocessor. Whereas here we have a single thread of execution and the instructions, appli application specific instructions deal with the data parallelism. As contrast, the GPU has many threads of execution where each instruction is doing a single uh, operation at a time, a single scalar operation at a time. So different ways of solving that problem. By doing a single thread of execution, we can leverage the compiler technology that's been around for many years and allow that to compile the dusty deck kind of applications out there for this platform. So what is a personality? A personality is a relocatable set of instructions that augments the x86 instruction set. Very similar to Intel and AMD putting out the SSE instructions over time. Those are pretty much application-specific instruction sets. They've identified some application, and they put an instruction set in that, did ex that, that accelerated that. So we're able to do the same thing, but we're able to load it on an application basis. So as an application needs a specific set of instructions, it can load that to use that. Each personality is a set of files that includes the bits that are loaded into the coprocessor, the FPGA configuration bits, as well as information used by the Convey compiler. That information is the instructions that are available in the personality, as well as the performance characteristics that allow the compiler to do the optimization. Then the third thing for the uh, personality is the information used by the GNU debugger to allow instructions to be disassembled as well as uh, uh, disassemble the machine state for that personality. So how do you program using a personality? Programming using ANSI C, C++, or Fortran, we have a unified compiler that has a common front end there, but dual back ends that generate the code. We, have, we started with the Open64 compiler, so we use its x86 code generator. We have put in place a Convey code generator that reads the personality information that I just talked about, telling it what instructions are available, as well as how to optimize them. And then the compiler identifies where the data parallelism exists in the application, and where it exists, it generates Convey code for that, but it generates x86 code for the entire application. Then at runtime, the x86 is able to determine if there's sufficient parallelism in each section to decide if it should start the, the uh, coprocessor. So the x86 would say, look at the vector length. If it's really short, then it may not make sense to start the coprocessor. And finally, the executable, once it's linked together in this uh, fat binary with both a uh, coprocessor and host code in it, uh, can be run on a standard x86 node or on a Convey uh, hybrid core node. So t taking a look at the uh, architecture of the system, on the left you have the host processor. It is a commodity motherboard with a Intel processor chipset, the I.O. subsystem and its uh, uh, memory subsystem, as well as a coprocessor on the right that's made up of three main sections. The host interface, which is used to start the coprocessor and deal with the cache coherency mechanisms. It's Got a memory controller, which also includes a TLB. <clears throat> the uh, memory controllers handle up to 16 DIMMs of, of uh, DDR2 memory that provides 80 gigabytes per second of bandwidth with ECC protection, and that's up to 128 gigabytes of memory. <clears throat> Then the third block there are the application engines, and this is where you have far, four large Xilinx FPGAs, and that's where you are able to load in an application-specific construction set. So if we dig down a little bit deeper into the coprocessor, what we have in the blue section there is the host interface again. It interfaces to the front side bus, but it also has a instruction decode. The, as I said, the coprocessor executes a thread of instructions. The instructions as they're decoded are, 
are done in the host interface. Those that are scalar type processing are done in the uh, scalar processor in the host interface. And those that do the uh, data parallelism part are passed on to the application engines where the uh, custom instructions can be performed. Um, on the lower part there, you see the memory controllers. There's eight memory controllers. Each one is able to handle two DIMM channels. And Convey has, uh, can handle both standard DIMMs, the kind you would buy at Fry's, say, as well as custom scatter gather DIMMs. So the custom scatter gather DIMMs can handle eight byte accesses to memory at full bandwidth. So if you're doing table lookups or strides to memory, um, then this type of uh, memory subsystem would be very beneficial for performance there. Then in the upper right, we have the application engines. As I said, that's four of uh, Xilinx's largest Vertex 5 FPGAs. As we all know, if you accelerate the compute aspects of an application, normally what you do is you find the next bottleneck in the system. So Convey has put a very high performance memory subsystem in place for this. Here are some of the aspects of that uh, memory subsystem. As I said, you can access by cache line or quad words, quad words being your eight byte from the custom uh, DIM there. We have uh, cache coherency support. We also have a prime number memory interleave sub, uh, system that allows full bandwidth on all strides other than if your stride is a uh, multiple of the, of the um, uh, prime number 31. As I said, we have standard or uh, custom scatter gather DIMs. We also have large virtual page support, four megabytes. That allows the entire application space of your application to reside in the TLB. So you would fault the TLB in once, and then it's there for the remainder of the application. We also have page coloring in the OS so that uh, these four megabyte pages are allocated such that not only does your prime number, prime number interleave work within a page, but across all the pages of your application. So if you have a very large three-dimensional, say, seismic problem, and you're striding across that, you'll get this perfect memory interleave pattern across that entire uh, application space. So how's the coprocessor started? The x86 processor reaches a point where it wants to start the coprocessor. It then writes a start message into a cache line. This cache line is, uh, is uh, in a specific location in memory, but virtual mapped. You put a personality signature in that tells the coprocessor what application specific instructions are needed. You put a start address, a virtual address there, and some number of parameters. Once that's set up, you then set a start bit in a second cache line. The coprocessor, as I said, is cache coherent. It is monitoring the cache coherency messages. And once it sees that the, the uh, cache line that has a start bit is being invalidated in its cache, it then takes that as a message that says it is now time to pull back both the start message and that start bit cache line into the coprocessor cache. It then verifies that the start bit has been set, and then it goes off and executes based on the, the uh, start message. So it uses the cache coherency, which you know, all processors have optimized that cache coherency to get the most latency out of it as possible. So we leverage that to be able to provide a very low latency start mechanism for the coprocessor. This mechanism works in the presence of host thread time sharing, as well as application paging, the front side bus, or QPI kind of interconnect. And the application can start the coprocessor either synchronously or asynchronously, allowing both the host and then the coprocessor to work simultaneously on the application. So this is a, a view of the inside of the coprocessor. So if you lift off the lid of the coprocessor, the top there, this is the top half, the top view of the coprocessor. As you see in that, in the four corners, you are the, there are 16 DIMMs, four in each corner. In front of each uh, set of four DIMMs are two memory controllers. Down the center are the four application engines, and then right in the center is the uh, host interface device. And the bottom view on this is your standard Intel motherboard, and then the two are um, married together through one of the sockets of the uh, motherboard. So now that I've given a framework for the uh, coprocessor, let me talk about some of the instruction set and innovations that allow these application uh, engine uh, instructions to be able to be loaded and, and work with the rest of the uh, system. So we have defined three classes of instructions for the coprocessor. 
We have address type instructions. These are instructions that would generate addresses for array references, say, as well as doing call and other kind of flow control instructions. We have scalar instructions that operate on um, scalar operands. These are, um, in general, these, once you've done these operations, you'll eventually pass the result over to the application engine to be used as an input to a, a data parallelism type of instruction. The third type of or class of instructions are application in instructions themselves. These are your SIMD type of instructions. The example there shows a scalar value being added to a vector of elements, producing a vector of elements result. The machine state for the address and scalar registers, you have A registers and S registers. And then for the application engine instructions, they're defined by the personality. The application instructions are what's loaded into the application engines. So the A and the S register instructions are predefined. All personalities can use those, those instructions. The uh, application engine instructions are defined on a per personality basis, so only the personality that uses it or defined it is able to use it. And for the location of execution, the address and scalar type instructions are performed by the scalar processor, which resides in the host interface there then the application engine instructions clearly are executed in the application engine. Okay. So one of the challenges here was how does the scalar processor interact with these application engine instructions and machine state, given that the, the uh, scalar processor is predefined, it's fixed. It does not change when you load in a new personality. Uh, so what is, if we look at the two examples there, the first one shows where we need to pass a scalar value over to the application engines. So we had, the, again, a scalar value being added to a vector value. The scalar value starts on the host processor. Presumably, it was performed or obtained by executing scalar instructions. And so the scalar processor has to know that it must wait until that scalar value, value um, is valid, does not have a hazard on it, before it can pass the instruction over to the application engine the application engine instruction that performs that add operation with the value of the S2 register. And then on the, the second example, there is where we're passing state back to the scalar processor. There we have a VL value, which is for, that, for this particular personality vector length, and is needed to be passed back to the IA5 register, an address register, presumably being used as an iterative iterator in the scalar processor. In that case, you have to wait until, you have to put a hazard on the A5 register and wait until your application specific instruction has passed that result back and stored it in the A5 before another scalar register can use that A5 value. So the way we solve this uh, dilemma is that we have partitioned the application engine decode space into regions. Each region has a predefined interaction with the scalar uh, a scalar processor in the host interface. And so when you define inst uh, custom instructions, application-specific instructions, you determine what the interaction is with the A and the S register state. And once you determine that, then you place that instruction in that predefined region that has that characteristic. So we haven't defined what the instructions do, only what the interaction is between the scalar state in the host interface and the state in the application engines. Okay. So a, a third innovation here is the uh, personality's machine state can be saved and restored to memory. Um, each personality defines its own machine state, defines its own register state. And then the instructions that you define do interactions on that uh, machine state. So the call processor machine state is saved and restored is saved and restored to memory only at instruction boundaries. So when you hit a breakpoint, you'll wait for all outstanding instructions that are being executed to uh, be, complete their operation, and then you're able to save the uh, machine state to memory. We do that using these uh, registers we call AEG registers, Application Engine Generic Registers. So all the machine state that's defined by a personality is mapped to that AEG register space. We have defined a, pre, a few uh, instructions that allow this AEG register state to be moved off to memory or, re, or pulled in back from memory. And then these following three instructions allow that to occur. The first instruction um, 
is a instruction that the SCADA processor essentially queries the personality, what's loaded in the AEG, reg AEG FPGAs, to say how many of these AEG registers are valid? How many of these 64-bit values do I need to pull over and store to memory? The second instruction there um, is used to restore state to the application engines. And so you, you would load into an S register, and then you'd move that to a specific AEG register using the A register shown there as an index to say which AEG register that needs to be restored to. And the third instruction there goes the opposite direction. It's used to save state of an AEG register out to memory. So once you've defined a personality and you've defined the machine state, then you map that machine state to these AEG registers, and that allows you to save and restore that context to memory. By having this common mechanism, the operating system has one machine state save restore routine that it uses for all personalities. So you don't have to have custom modifications to the operating system to be able to save and restore state from a new personality. So by having this uh, machine state that's able to be saved and restored to memory, you can then run a high-level high language debugger. In this case, we use the GNU debugger. We use Linux as the operating system. And using this debugger, you can then single step, run, stop, breakpoint instructions. You can disassemble the uh, screenshot that's shown there. The upper part of it is disassembly of the x86 instructions. So we set a breakpoint within the x86 host and disassemble that part of it. We told it to continue running. We then set, had a breakpoint in a coprocessor set of application engine specific instructions. And then we did a disassembly of those instructions. So this GNU debugger has been modified to read in the, the uh, information of a personality to understand how to disassemble instructions, how to display and modify state within your uh, personality. By, by doing this, you're then able to um, develop a personality and debug it using high-level language support. So now transitioning to showing some uh, application examples here. This first personality shows is a, a single precision vector personality. It, uh, in the upper right there, you show, I show the four application engines. Those are the four large Xilinx FPGAs. Each one has a dispatch block at the top, which receives instructions from the scalar processor. It has a crossbar interface at the bottom, which interacts then with the memory subsystem. And then in the middle there are the, uh, the vertical um, blocks there. That is the, uh, what we call function pipes, which is the data path part that's replicated. So the lower left there shows one function pipe. That function pipe is replicated uh, 32 times across those four application engines. It is essentially a traditional type of a vector processor. It's got a vector register file that has your uh, vector registers. We have 64 vector registers, each with um, 1,024 uh, elements in each vector. You've got a load store unit that loads from memory into that vector register file. You've got a miscellaneous unit there in the center, which is able to do address generation as well as converts, um, floating point adds. And then on the right, you have a set of four fused multiply add uh, function units that are able to do single precision operations. So as a whole there, you have uh, 128 of these fused multiply add operations that are be able to be done each clock in parallel. So this is a SIMD kind of a uh, personality. We've optimized it for signal processing. It's got uh, support for single precision complex operations. And it, it uh, supports out-of-order execution as well as register renaming. So this personality, the hardware will unroll loops and provide the latency hiding itself. This shows some performance on single precision, on, uh, single precision FFTs. On the left is for a 1D FFT. And it shows on the bottom curve there a Nehalem. It's a, a one-core uh, Nehalem using the MKL library. At the time, they didn't have it with any more than just a single core. I don't know if they do now or not. But it shows there that with a Nehalem, you eventually reach the point where you're filled up the cache, and then eventually you've uh, broken the TLB as well, and so your performance uh, trails off as the problem set gets larger. However, with the coprocessor, because the TLB covers the entire address space of the application, and there isn't a cache in the, uh, this particular personality, once you hit your near peak there, you're able to sustain that for the 
size of the problem until it uh, exceeds the size of memory in the uh, coprocessor. Uh, on the right, you see a 2D FFT. It's got uh, similar characteristics for the coprocessor. For the uh, Nehalem, this is a eight core solution. And you see that the, uh, at the 1K point, um, I don't know if it's the memory bandwidth, the cache access, or the just optimizations, but it spikes there to a fairly high performance. But all the other points are down you know, in the uh, less than or around 20 uh, gigaflop range. Um, and so that's a performance comparison there of the FFTs. So this personality is a financial analytics personality used for doing Monte Carlo kind of simulations. What we've done here is we've taken the previous uh, infrastructure, we've traded out the fuse to multiply ads and put in double precision, and then we've also added specific application instructions to accelerate that workload, that being random number generation as well as exponential log and, and other intrinsics. So we put specific instructions in to handle what's required by that workload. And this allows the guys, the folks on Wall Street, to use a compile and run kind of a model. Convey has developed this personality, and with our hybrid core system, they can then use a compile and run model so they don't have to understand FPGAs or the tools needed to support FPGAs. They just use a standard compiler, debugger, and then run their application. This third example is a protein uh, sequencing personality. It again has the four application engines there shown. It has, it uh, was done in, uh, jointly with uh, UCSD using their inspect application. It uh, performs, as I said, protein sequencing. We took their best, the best match routine of that algorithm, dropped it into a state machine for a custom instruction. It's a MIMD kind of instruction where each of those state machines has access to the memory for loads and stores. So each one can determine what load pattern needs to be done and what results need to be stored to memory. And it executes greater than 100 times faster than a single Nehalem core. So in summary, Convey has, Convey's approach provides a virtual cache coherent global address space, instruction-based FPGA compute model, ANSI standard C, C++, and Fortran high-level language support, integrated debugging using GDB. Uh, so the Convey system allows users to develop applications as one would a standard CPU-based system, giving you the compile and run kind of model that is required for most, most uh, companies out there that have you know, software development organizations, but they don't have hardware development organizations. So this greatly broadens the, uh, the uh, marketplace for FPGA-based compute systems. Thank you. <clears throat> now open for questions. Again, please come to one of the mics. State your name and affiliation. Ramesh Nopsis. Um, do you expect to expose this, how to develop a personality to any end users, or is that always? Good question. Them? So Convey is focusing on the markets where you can sell many of these platforms. Um, you know, financial analytics, other ones where you have thousands of uh, potential deployment there. We do have a, a personality development kit that allows customers to develop their own personalities. Up front here, Convey has spent the majority of its time developing the infrastructure, the framework for all this to, to work together. We have spent some time on these personalities, as you've seen. Many of these... Uh, um, uh, beta systems that are out, customers are actually using that uh, personality development kit, developing their own personalities to do their own special kind of, uh, you know, custom instruction sets. So yes, we do support that currently. One second quick question. Can you disclose the list price for your system? That is something that I'll let you talk to our uh, sales guys to, to deal with. <laughs> Not my area. So Todd Besnick, no affiliation currently. Um, this question is related. Um, I'm wondering if you could give some kind of person month number for creating one of your personalities. You know, you have to design so when the Convey, NSA and the hardware and do the software work. Right. So when Convey develops one of these personalities, it, it'll take, you know, six months, nine months to develop a personality. And that's, you know, we have to go out and work with the customer, understand the application, what the needs are there. You have to then, 
you know, define the architecture, the instructions, the machine state, and so forth, and make sure it's, it's going to solve the problem. You then go off and you, uh, we go through the simulation, the hardware development. We push the, the clock rate of these FPGAs fairly high since we're trying to give as much performance, 300 and some, 333 uh, megahertz a clock rate for it. And then the compiler work is, uh, is being done in parallel. Um, and the compiler is table driven, so as time goes on, it becomes much easier to uh, do the compiler work. And the GDB uh, information is, is very quick to do. So it, it's in that time frame. And over time, it will get shorter as we have more infrastructure. So, so you have 32 people in your organization, so it'd be safe to say that it's about 16 people over at least six months. 16 Something. people? So I, I was talking about maybe one or two people doing a personality for six months or so. Okay. So then using your personality development tool, um, might that shrink? So we certainly use tools inside to do personalities for, uh, but it, you know, it really depends. These personalities I showed here are fairly complex ones. Um, that inspect one that I showed there, the very last one, although it looked like a fairly complex state machine, it was really the easiest one to do because you, you had one routine that you were trying to drop down using this personality development kit. And so it was pretty much predefined to begin with. You said start to it and it goes off and executes for days. And so, you know, in that case, yes, you can drop that time for something like that down to maybe three months. I mean, it's pretty much predefined and you're just doing that one state machine. So it really varies on how complicated it is, you know, what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. Thank you. We're running a little behind. Last question. Okay. Al Alcorn of Catenary. Uh, you say you connect this coprocessor to the motherboard through a socket. Yes. How, how, what socket is that? It's, so we use a front side bus socket, a front side bus system for this first uh, platform. Um, so I honestly can't tell you what the socket is. Our development guys certainly okay. could. But it's, you know, it's the standard LGA kind of a... Where a CPU goes? Yes, oh, where the okay. CPU goes. All right, let's thank our speaker. Okay, sorry about that. Our uh, next session, or sorry, our next speaker, we have a, uh, actually a, a treat, two speakers. So uh, we're going to have two, uh, two gentlemen who are collaborating on a project. The first is Alan Cantle. He founded Nalatech in 1993. Uh, he's, he was the president and CEO until 2006. He's now the president responsible for strategy and business development. He received a first class honors degree in electronics from Plymouth University in the UK. And uh, one uh, bit of note here, too, is what we'll have is both speakers speaking for half the usual time, and then they'll take questions after uh, they've both spoken. So, Alan? Hi. Um, just before I start, there was, a, there was some, something mentioned on FPGAs yesterday with regards to, to um, uh, performance per watt. Uh, I'd like to just uh, state that actually uh, FPGAs compare very admirably on performance per watt on G compared to GPUs and microprocessors. And it's fundamentally around you build a compute engine around the data flow. So therefore, uh, you're not moving data around, whereas with processors, you're pulling data to and fro. So that's one advantage you might like to think about in, in your architectures moving forward. So I'm going to talk about uh, Xeon socket filler uh, FPGA accelerators where we actually plug an FPGA accelerator directly into a Xeon socket. I'm just going to cover the hardware, and Paul will go into some software um, uh, running on this uh, uh, product. So fundamentally, uh, this is a modular approach. So we have three modules that actually can stack in various combinations, as you'll see in a moment. Um, uh, we plug in frontside bus into an Intel Caneland uh, MP platform. Uh, with, a, with a front side bus speed of 1066. Um, uh, we, we have, our, over the 15 years that we've been working with FPGAs, we've got various high level development tools, including the C to VHDL compiler. And in working closely with Intel and Xilinx on this, um, we, we, we've got a, Intel's got a, a, an API that they call Quick Assist Accelerator Abstraction Layer, which I'll just touch on in a little bit more detail now. Um, 
basically, when, when Intel decided to start more aggressively supporting accelerators, uh, they, they came up with a framework uh, where to make, really make it easier to, to access accelerators. So this is where the quickest accelerator extraction layer came from. It's, it's a standard C++ API, uh, which you include in with your application, and it does various things like dis device discovery. It is driven by the CPU. It's CPU-initiated reads and CPU-initiated writes uh, to and from the FPGA accelerator. Um, I'll just switch on to the next slide. So this one uh, basically is just a, a, a block-level di diagram of the topology of, of, the, of, of AAL, quickest at AAL. The main thing I want to really point out here is, is in the application layer, at the user layer, what Intel want, wanted to do was to make uh, the accelerator almost look transparent to the programmer. So whereas you're used to using various library functions, um, you would have a common library for all of your accelerators, and the, uh, the operating system would understand the performance and the capability of each accelerator in executing that particular library component. And it would, it would know, it would interrogate and know what devices were available in, in your system and whether they were busy or not, and therefore it could, uh, it could schedule in the accelerator a, a, as applicable. That's the sort of a vision. It's not exactly there at the moment, but that's where... Where, where, where we're trying to take it. At the lower level, it's des also designed to be um, compatible with PCI Express accelerators as well as a front side bus and moving forward to QPI. Um, this is the Intel Kingland server platform that, that we're actually running in. You can see the four sockets, which will become clear in a moment. Um, and I'll go into a few more details on the server. Uh, basically, um, you can see here this is a 4U box. You've got the quite high tower heat sinks for each of the four Xeons. There's um, uh, four memory bays for 256 gigabytes of memory. And you've also got seven PCI slots, amongst other things. Uh, this is in a more of a block diagram uh, picture of the server. So it's a tra traditional front side bus. You've got 21 gigabytes per second to the 256 gigabytes of system memory. Um, as well as that, uh, that, you've got two PCI Express by eight buses coming out of the North Bridge, going to four PCI Express by eight slots, and a one, uh, by four straight out of the North Bridge as well, plus the additional three, uh, two slots come out of the South Bridge in by four interface. The four Xeons here uh, basically um, uh, are obviously more traditional, but you can actually plug in uh, one, two, or three of the FPGA uh, accelerator stacks. Now, we, as it become clearer, we can get up to five FPGAs in each stack, um, and also we have off-module off I/O bandwidth of up to 10 gigabytes per second uh, per, spat, per, per stack natively. So um, that's a, that's native. It can be configured for various interfaces, such as up to 60 one gigabit Ethernet channels can come into there. Um, just to give you an idea. This stack in this 4U box would give you one and a half uh, teraflops of single precision performance. Um, uh, and, and, and again, that will that'll become a little bit clearer a bit later. So just to look at the individual modules in detail, we've got the base module. And the base module is, is basically the primary interface to the front side bus and is not accessible to the user. It runs at the eight gigabytes uh, per second peak bandwidth. The sustained bandwidth we actually achieve is about five gigabytes per second reading from system memory to the FPGA and about two and a half gigabytes per second from the uh, FPGA back to system memory. The low level core actually has quite a good latency uh, of 105 nanoseconds, but by the time you build up the communication in, and the API around that, we're, we're talking of the order of a microsecond latency to and from the, uh, the user FPGA components. We use an LX110 uh, FPGA on, on that base one. So that's the only control FPGA, if you, if you like, is not really doing anything for you. The next module, next two modules, first of all, there's the FSB compute module. Um, this has uh, two of the largest Vertex 5 FPGAs. And for those of you that are familiar with FPGAs, um, just to get, give you an idea of the size, it's 200,000 six input uh, lookup tables. Uh, it's the largest amount you can fit in. That's a typo. That should be 1,056 DSP48 blocks. 
and a DSP48 block is effectively a Mac, which is a 25 by 18 bit input into the Mac. Um, and up to a thousand two kilobyte uh, block memories are just distributed across the, uh, across the chip. Um, the actual board itself has four independent banks of, uh, of, of SRAM, uh, two per FPGA, uh, up to eight megabytes per bank and eight gigabytes per second uh, total bandwidth for those SRAMs. And the total off module mo uh, bandwidth down and up is, is 25.6 gigabytes per second. Um, and you've got the ability to stack multiple of these devices. Um, the FSB expansion, as we call it, has one of the large FPGAs, plus it has some co connectors to bring external I.O. onto the actual module. To look at this a different way, more from a compute perspective, one of these FPGAs, um, really from a, from a fixed precision and a bit manipulation, can deliver well over a teraflop, a teraop of, of performance, depending on the, pre the precision you're actually using. But they're fairly admirable at single and double precision as well. You can get a 100 gigaflop single precision, and that's after you've done the interfacing to memories and communication. That's available to you, to, to, for you to use for real. And 40 gigaflops double precision per, per device. This one has four banks of SRAM connected to the one FPGA and up to 16 gigabytes per second to those four banks of SRAM. Um, the, in terms of the communications off module, there's gigabit serial, Surdes um, communications, there's uh, 20 lanes, um, uh, it's 62.5 gigabits per second. Um, and also it has the LVDS off module I.O. So if you're actually communicating to something like a, a, a video camera uh, with, with a camera link interface, which is uh, used a lot in the embedded world, then you can get, uh, you can get direct inputs from, from things like cameras. And that has an ultra low latency of, of 20 nanoseconds in terms of communicating from, from the devices there. So just to show you how this socket actually builds up, this is the Xeon socket you saw in the server, one of, one of four. Um, it's, it's basically a zero insertion for socket. We actually plug an interposer into that, which will adapt to our, our base module. So this is the one with the main communication back to the FSB uh, host. It's a bridge to it. And then, uh, well, we've got a heat sink uh, on, on top of that. And then we have a very, uh, our own custom high density interconnect, 1500 pins at 0.8 uh, millimeters pitch. They actually bring the low, the, the low latency LVDS links uh, between the modules. That mounts onto the module, and then we mount the compute module on top. Uh, so that's mating on, on there with, with its heat sinks. And another compute module with the, another hot set of connectors can be mounted on. And finally, another set and we can mount on the I.O. module. So this all fits in one single Xeon socket, five FPGAs in one single Xeon socket, uh, and heatsink there. So that, that's, a, that's the relative size of, of the module. The complete stack uh, gives you the raw compute performance of half a, half a teraflop of single precision, 200 gigaflops double precision in a single Xeon socket, or a well over five teraops of integer bit manipulation. The power consumption is limited to 130 watts, which is what the socket will actually deliver. Um, so that's roughly 24 watts per FPGA. Um, currently, we only sell this as a pre-configured stack in the server, but we are working on uh, customer available insertion and extraction tools and uh, access to the calibration software for, for, uh, for actually configuring the socket. So just to, just to show you the buildup of, of the stacked module, you can see um, uh, the, the five FPGAs in the communication. And again, each one of these gray buses is 6.4 gigabytes per second. And the communication from the FPGA to FPGA, from real compute to real compute, is, is approximately 20 nanoseconds. Um, and that's about it. I'll hand over to Paul now. Okay, our next speaker is Paul Chow. He is a uh, on the faculty of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Toronto since 1988. Uh, he's a full professor and holds a chaired position in uh, engineering design. He's uh, been on the board, or sorry, is on the board of um, 
CMC Microsystems. He's been the co-founder of Excel Lite Networks, and he's also a co-founder of Arches Computer System. He'll now be speaking about programmable uh, the software aspects. Um, so Alan's showing you some uh, neat hardware. I'm going to tell you an approach to programming it. This has evolved out of a research project out of the University of Toronto that we're also presently trying to de further develop and commercialize uh, as a company called Arctis Computing Systems. So what do we got? We've got uh, you know, high performance CPU cores. We've got big FPGAs, a lot, lot of them, five of them. And inside these FPGAs, we can put a lot of other cores and not just one core per FPGA, but many cores. Those cores could be embedded processors. They could be uh, accelerators, uh, cores that we put in. Now we wanna put this all together. And so what do we got? We got a heterogeneous platform. We've got processors, hardware, different types of processors. So cool box, now how do we program it, right? It's a pretty daunting task to think of this as you know, just a big chunk of hardware and how do we build some application on it. Now, my motivation is that we're actually trying to build, uh, actually started many year, about four years ago, even before this particular platform existed, was to build molecular dynamics. I spent uh, actually 25 years ago, I arrived here as a postdoc, worked with uh, John and Mark on the, some of the MIPS uh, uh, risk technology, and that was, a, that was a cool time in computer architecture. And as somebody said last night, it's kind of hard to do that at university now. But we've got big FPGAs, and we can build big things now that way, and that's kind of the direction I went. So, okay, I like to build computing things. Uh, what's a big problem? Uh, molecular dynamics. So I've hooked up with a biochemistry professor uh, we have a biochemistry PhD student working on the project. Okay, so how do we program molecular dynamics on a system like this? Okay, you can start out and you can say, well, okay, I might have to have more than one host. You know, how do I connect those together? I'm going to look at all kind of the, what's the programmer faced with. I've got interfaces host to host. Maybe I'll use sockets, maybe kind of crude, but, you know, that's an example. I've got multiple cores, and I need to coordinate those. Oh, okay, this is kind of a shared memory system. Maybe I'll use p-threads as part of my application. Um, in, I have these accelerators, FPGAs. I have to now have my software in the x86 or the core talk to uh, the accelerator, probably vendor-specific, or now there's AAL, but you know, there are other kind of boxes like this, and they all have their own kind of API. Uh, within my FPGAs, I've got accelerators, hardware, talking to hardware, how do they communicate? And embedded processors in there, how do they communicate? Okay, so I've got this big mixed bag of things that's going to be pretty hard for, I'm going to tell a biochemist, you know, let's uh, build an application and figure all this out. Okay, so what do we want? We want a unified programming model. I want to hide all this stuff up here. So I want to make it easy for this biochemist to build an application onto this system. Okay, I want portability. Now, that's something that you know, somebody told me last year at a conference. I've never seen you know, an application built on one FPGA platform able to move to another one. Okay, so let's figure out if we can do this portability thing. We all like that in the software world. You know, that gets us a lot. Scalability. You know, in molecular dynamics, you know, I'd like to run it on one processor. If I've got a blue gene and 64,000 processors, I'd like to run the same code, but just be able to scale it. Let's see if we can do that. Okay, so let's just step back, and I'll say this is kind of the model most people think about when they're using accelerators. Okay, so I have a host. I have this, in this case, an FPGA. And there's some vendor interface here over some kind of high-speed uh, link in between. Um, but the important thing here is this is a slave, okay? So anything that this does has to be initiated by the host. I can't scale this kind of architecture very well. And more importantly, I can't have this guy 
talk to another FPGA, maybe on another host, or even in another socket, very easily without going back to the host processor. Okay, let's step back again. I'm an application person. This is the way I want to think about a problem. It's nothing here yet about what it's implemented on. I'm going to just think about, I got a bunch of tasks. So here's a simple task graph. Represents some kind of parallel application. Um, and, but I do know in this uh, application that, you know, if I can get a whole bunch of these tasks, that's where I'm going to parallelize. So what we've been hearing, this is the task level parallelism. Now, if you think about that previous model, you know, this kind of an application isn't going to easily uh, fit on that kind of a, a platform. Okay, so how do we, and I'll just kind of walk you through at a high level how we go about building an application. Okay, so we'll start with something. Um, so our biochemist, Chris, uh, he writes his application in MPI, and if you don't know MPI very quickly, it's a message passing API, uh, very common in the high performance computing world it's for distributed memory systems. Lots of tools around, lots of free application libraries and things like that. A lot of people know how to make it work. So I'm going to build this application and kind of, you know, using this as our uh, template, write it in API. We'll get MPI software that's working. This is our prototype. Okay, it's a software prototype. It's going to define all the protocols, the communication, the data movement, the control, synchronization. Everything's defined here in software. We've got all the tools available to make that work. That's our prototype. Okay, we can even play around with it and figure out you know, what takes a long time, what doesn't, figure out partitioning. And then we'll identify how we're going to map this onto our platform. So here's how I might map that. I might run two of those tasks on a high performance processor. Here's my accelerators. And oh, there's a little task here, not a high performance task, but maybe collecting some information. And I'll run that on a soft processor. OK, now how do I build these accelerators? OK, so I've got this very well-defined uh, description of the task because I already built it in software and MPI, so I could take that piece of code. Now I have to map that into hardware. OK, this gets hard. This is the hard part. Um, so I'll use, we're currently a hardware designer to do that. But you know, if I had a good C to Gates tool, I could do that. The important thing is I've got this spec up here. I don't need to be an application expert to do that uh, conversion, i.e. I don't have to be a biochemist to know how to do that well. It's already been specced. I just need to know how to convert it to efficient hardware. The MPI protocols that we're using in software, right, we would load an MPI library and use that to do the message um, send and receives. In hardware, I've got a hardware engine now, so I can't use that library. But I've, we've built what we call the message passing engine that will implement a large number or some number of those functions. OK, so what's this accelerator look like? OK, so let's here on the left here is kind of a, a simple uh, MPI task. OK, it does some initialization here. It gets data, computes on it finishes computing, sends the data off, and eventually finishes, OK? Now, I want to convert this into hardware. And there's a fairly sort of uh, well-defined structure. So I've got a state machine. The state machine really reflects the control flow of this code over here. Now, this is a fairly simple code uh, control flow. Could be more complex. Uh, so you can see that this is maps fairly directly. This here is really a wait state that's waiting for this compute engine to do its thing. So first thing, as this uh, fires up, you know, as I turn everything on, it'll probably run the init to do whatever it needs to do. And then it'll send the receive. And that all goes from the state machine up this command, uh, FIFO. 
into uh, the message passing engine. So again, that's our library equivalent of the MPI library. It will implement these MPI commands onto our on-chip network. Now, our on-chip network, just very briefly, is the way all the messages are carried. Um, it is built so that it can work on the chip. Can, we've built the interface to go between the chip and the interface to go from an FPGA through that front side bus interface into the x86. So it's all transparent from the application point of view. So I might send the receive command out here. This goes off. Eventually, data comes back. Um, state machine figures that out, tells the compute engine to run, uh, waits, compute engine finishes, uh, pushes its data out here, tells the state machine, which does the send, and off it goes. Okay, so this hardware is going to do exactly the same thing as the software. And in fact, what we often do is we'll, before we even put the hardware in, we'll put the microblaze in there, run the software version of it, take the exact code that we ran on the x86 and run it, recompile it and run it in the microblaze just to see if we can get all this other communication stuff working. And then because this interface here is well defined, uh, we build the hardware engine, we just drop, take out the processor, drop it in. So it's kind of plug and play. Okay, so how do we get portability? Uh, portability in software we see, well, we have this MPI layer. Same thing over here. Now, what we, we don't have a hardware OS, but we have our hardware middleware layer, which is really, in a sense, this layer here. So if all our engines work to this layer, we can port it from platform to platform. We've done that several times. Scalability, we want to go from one FPGA to more, to modules, to platforms. Uh, MPI gives all of that to us naturally, uh, so the application doesn't actually have to worry about it. Just finally, just a, a few configurations that we've tested. Um, so the black boxes represent the MPI tasks. We're just bouncing data between these two tasks. Uh, we've got it within two cores, from a core to uh, a hardware engine in an FPGA, between two cores in an FPGA. And what we've done, in fact, and I don't think we like to think nobody else has done this, FPGA is transferring to another FPGA over the front side bus, okay, without the processor involved. So we're measuring round trip time, uh, latency, you can see this here. Uh, this is just to the base module that Alan described. We can move our tasks anywhere into any of the modules. Uh, so these are some of the numbers uh, that we get. Latency-wise, you can see Xeon to Xeon, it's pretty good. Uh, you're going to see some cache effects here. We think that's instead of memory to memory, which is what's happening down here. Uh, this is transfers between caches. Um, point of note, so latency, raw latency with the Xilinx uh, driver is a half microsecond. Bandwidth currently about two gigabytes per second. That's improving as Xilinx improves their uh, interface. Um, the point here is this is preliminary. We're using the rendezvous protocol. If you're familiar with that, that's kind of a very safe protocol. Um, has a fair amount of handshaking with a more a lightweight protocol. It's only about a microsecond. Getting closer to what we have here. And there's still a lot more room. We're only running at 133 megahertz. And, 32-bit channels, we can do a lot better. So just to wrap up, with this approach, the application, the important things, the application is abstracted from the underlying layer. So the application developer can um, work without worrying too much about what's underneath. We've achieved sort of scalability and portability, and we're working on the performance, and we've got a cool box. So very quickly. Part of it's a research project, so I have to thank the sponsors of that. And finally, that's the end. So I think. We have just a few minutes for a couple questions for either of our two uh, speakers.
Are you, are you going to migrate this to QPI at any point soon? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> On both sides. <laughs> I mean, so that portability here, I mean, we just build at our level just the QPI to our in, uh, network interface, but again, the application doesn't see that. The application just speaks MPI. If you could come to the microphone. So we could. Uh, Wolfgang Rosenstiel, University of Tübingen, Germany. Uh, some of your applications you have mentioned, I think, have some simil similarities, uh, which also have been brought forward yesterday on, on Sunday uh, with the uh, NVIDIA CUDA kind of uh, GPU-like uh, accelerations. Uh, you didn't mention or somehow you did not uh, compare your ideas to that approach. Uh, could you comment on that? So we're still working on it, and I don't want to predict where we're at. I mean, MD is a big application and there's only really like three students working on this. Uh, we've got little cores of the application running and they run, you know, 40, 50, 60 times faster than what it would run on a, a single CPU core. But, and we can put two or three of those into one of the big FPGAs. Now this is a multiprocessor system and until I kind of put it all together and see w what it looks like, you know, I won't, you know, my gut feeling and hope is that we're on the order of hundreds of, uh, um, you know, several hundred X performance, 500, 600 X performance over what you would get out of that same box if I put a bunch of Xeons in there. A, a, a more general way to look at it as well is, um uh, as I've shown on the numbers of performance, in terms of the gigaflops for single precision and double precision, uh, it's, it's comparable with the Xeon uh, per FPGA. But obviously, we've got five of them, so that you've got that benefit there. But um, uh, where it really excels is in the, uh, the fixed point uh, and, and also the bit manipulation area. So you can get from hundreds to thousands of acceleration when you're doing that sort of level of things. So the things like encryption, compression algorithms, uh, uh, that's where, where the FPGA can really, really uh, outperform both the GPUs and, uh, and, and the microprocessors, and that's where it really comes in. But that said, if you have a very pipelineable function, you get very high efficiency. Uh, you have the chance of getting very high efficiency out of the, uh, out of the FPGA, maybe compared with a processor implementation as well. I think we'll also have an interesting comparison at the end. So molecular dynamics, there's a DE Shaw building an ASIC-based machine spending hundreds of millions of dollars. There's NVIDIA, there's one Mei Hu at uh, Illinois who's got an NVIDIA cluster that they're working on. So they're gonna obviously be GPUs and we'll have an FPGA-based system and in about a year, we'll see how they all turn out. It'll be an interesting experiment. All right, great. Let's thank our speakers. All right, the last talk of this session is by Lawrence Spracklin. He's a senior processor architect at Sun Microsystems. He has a, a PhD in electronic engineering from the University of Aberdeen, and he'll be speaking to us about a, a dedicated accelerator targeting cryptography. All right, so I'm going to be talking today about uh, Sun's third generation on-chip security accelerator for our UltraSpark processes. And before I dive into the details of that, I'd just like to sort of motivate some of the enhancements that we've made to our third generation accelerator. So I think we'd all agree that security is becoming ever more essential, right? We all know this. We all want to secure our web servers, our file servers, our um, web servers, our databases, and so on and so forth, right? But as I look around me, it's actually the small minority of systems that are secured. So why is this? Well, there's a number of reasons, but one of the reasons, at least, is that there is a high performance overhead associated with security. So if I have a system that's running in an unsecure mode, I flip that sort of metaphorical switch and go secure, you know, a two, five, or even 10x slowdown, 
you know, can be fairly commonplace. And that's really unacceptable to most people, and it is this high cost that is hindering adoption. So what can we think about doing this? About, yeah. So, you know, general purpose processes are actually fairly inefficient at performing cryptographic processing. And the cryptographic processing is what underlies a lot of these security protocols that are in use. And so what we can think about doing is obviously taking it and offloading it to a custom accelerator that can perform that processing you know, in order of magnitude faster. And then we take something that once contributed the majority of the runtime, and now we reduce that by, say, 20x or more, and it's just a few percent. So we should be able to move to a situation where we have an unsecured application, we go secure, and you know, performance remains relatively the same. We see the two, three, maybe 5% slowdown. And you know, if we can reach that point, then I think that's going to be a lot more palatable to a lot more people. But you know, this is nothing new, right? I mean, we've had off-chip accelerators for the longest time, right? But we're still not at that point. And unfortunately, there tends to be a lot of limitations associated with using sort of traditional off-chip PCI-based accelerators, right? I mean, you have your system, you plug them in, and we should be good to go. But unfortunately, there tends to be a lot of latency and overhead associated with performing an offload to these PCI-based accelerators, both software and, over and hardware. And so really, this tends to limit the type of application um, or the type of operation that you can think about offloading um, in a cost-effective manner. So you can think about, say, offloading something like a long-duration RSA operation, but you're going to be a little more constrained if you want to op you know, offload, say, an AA AES encryption of a small packet. And unfortunately, you know, while there are certainly um, applications that do focus on these longer-duration application um, operations, there are you know, classes of application out there that are really, I mean, they're doing a lot of cryptographic operations, but they're really just focused on small packets, small objects. And unfortunately, you know, when you have something that's sort of sat off in the backwaters of the system, it's very difficult to extract the sort of cost-effective performance benefits that you want from it. And so really what we've seen in recent years is the accelerators are moving closer to the cores, right? I mean, part of this is to try and address some of the off-chip latency considerations, and also part of it is just the general SOC on-chip migration. So we are seeing them moving closer to the cores, and hopefully this will allow us to address some of these application spaces where you know, we failed to date to really deliver on this sort of notion of zero-cost security to a greater and lesser degree. And you know, if we look around as many of the processes that are out today or are coming down the pipe have at least some on-chip support for cryptography, be it in the form of a closely coupled discrete accelerator or you know, some customization of the ISA for cryptographic acceleration. So I mentioned that there's a lot of application spaces out there that are really focused on small packet sizes. So I just wanted a couple of examples here. Um, we're first looking at the uh, SpecWeb 2005 banking workload. Now, this is an interaction between a client and a banking server. The entire session is encrypted. And if we look at the processing being performed by the, the web server here, you can see that the vast majority of the packets that are being processed are very, very small in nature. 37% of the objects are less than 100 bytes. 89% of the objects are less than 1.5 KB. And so if we want to see effective acceleration, Use an accelerator in this case. We'd better be very cost conscious about the offload overheads. We you know, have the accelerator focus on small offloads. I own this, this um, distribution is you know, fairly typical in many web-based applications. And it's not just limited to the web. I mean, you know, a couple of other examples here. I mean, if you think about IPsec saying go, going over Ethernet, you're going to bump into the, say, 1,500-byte MTU in a lot of cases. And so the maximum packet size you're going to see is, again, about 1.5 KB. Similarly, for streaming video or streaming voice, you've got a lot of data that's being transferred, a lot of it's being cryptographically processed in a lot of instances, but we're focused on very small packets. For VoIP, for example, you're about 250 bytes. And here you have additional constraints. These are real-time packets, right? So you can, can't even think about batching up a bunch of these guys and submitting them as a single operation, right? So there's a lot of constraints. And this really requires us to think about controlling the offload overheads associated with using the accelerator if we want to try and break into some of these application spaces. So hopefully this sets the stage to an extent for some of the enhancements that we've t undertaken in our uh, third generation accelerator. As I said, we are focusing on the third generation accelerator. That sort of implies there's been a couple of generations prior to that, and in fact, that is the case. We debuted our first accelerator with the Orthospark T1 processor back in 2005. Many of you may know that processor better by its code name, which was the Niagara processor. There is an accelerator per core, <coughs> excuse me, 
up to a maximum of eight accelerators per chip. The accelerators here target public key cryptography, so they're accelerating things like RSA, Diffie-Hellman, DSA. We followed that up two years later with the UltraSpark T2 processor. This had our second generation accelerator. Um, we carried forward the support from the prior generation of accelerator and also enhanced the accelerators to support bulk ciphers, secure hashes, and elliptic curve cryptography. That brings us to our third generation accelerator. Again, there's an accelerator per core, up to a maximum of 16 accelerators per chip. This accelerator debuts with our upcoming Rainbow Falls processor. The accelerators carry forward the support we've seen in the prior two generations and also have been further enhanced to support an additional box cipher, an additional secure hash, and this non-priv fast path to the accelerators. And this is actually this fast path that I'm going to dwell on for a lot of the remainder of the presentation. And what we're trying to do here is essentially allow user land applications to interact very closely with these on-chip accelerators and very cost-effectively offload even small packets. I'm going to be constraining most of this talk just to talking about the accelerators on Rainbow Falls. Actually, a colleague of mine will be talking more generally about our upcoming Rainbow Falls processor in a later session today. So let's now look at the accelerators themselves in more detail. They're composed of two subunits. There's a modular arith arithmetic unit that does the public key stuff. There's a cipher and hash unit, which accelerates the ciphers and the hashes. These accelerators can operate in parallel and they also operate in parallel with the cores eight strands. So basically you can have the situation where the cores eight strands are operating, and in parallel with that you have the two accelerator subunits all doing useful work. The accelerators are shared by the cores eight strands, and as a result the, hyper, the accelerators are hyperprivileged. The accelerators expose a lightweight interface to software. Communication with the accelerators is basically via a in-memory control word queue. So essentially there's an in-memory FIFO. So if the hypervisor wants to offload an operation to the accelerator, it formulates a control word, it places it into the control word queue, it advances the accelerator's tail pointer, the accelerator starts operating, and then informs the hypervisor when the operation has completed. You can interact both synchronously or asynchronously with the accelerator, synchronously being better obviously for the shorter duration operations, asynchronously better. When you've got a longer duration operation, you can actually go and do some useful work and then an interrupt is generated when processing has completed. <coughs> Excuse me. So we actually support a variety of the common algorithms required for things like SSL, um, IPsec, and we support the algorithms that are mandated by NIST Suite B. We support DARES, triple DARES, AAS, or key sizes. With Rainbow Falls, we've also introduced support for the Kasumi cipher, which is very hot in the mobile telephony space. On the secure hash side, we have MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256, SHA-512. Public key side, we have RSA, and as I mentioned previously, we have support for Diffie-Hellman DSA. We also have support for e ECC, and we support both integer and binary polynomial ECC. The accelerators are very adept at streaming data, and so we see good performance irrespective of where the data is located. It can be L2 cache resident or DRAM resident. We still see good performance out of the accelerators. From the uh, bulk cipher standpoint, we support the common modes of operation. We have HMAC support, and also, especially in the networking space, you may find that your packets are distributed across multiple discrete packets, uh, multiple discrete buffers, sorry. And for that case, we provide hardware gather support. In addition to this cryptographic support in the accelerators, the accelerators also support IP checksum, CRC32, and high-speed data movement. So that's the support we have in the accelerators themselves. In addition to that, on the Rainbow Falls processor, we also introduce some new instructions that are crypto-orientated. So we have umolex high. This basically returns the upper 64 bits of a 64-bit by 64-bit multiplication. Um, this, along with some of the new add and carry instructions we've introduced, allows software to write uh, big num functions that operate directly on 64-bit data chunks, which gives you a nice performance uptick. We also have support for X mol X and X mol X high. This is a different flavor of multiplication. It's an XOR multiplication in which carry chains have been broken. This kind of operation underlies a lot of the compute that's actually done in Gawa field computations. If you don't have this hardware support, Gawa field tends to be fairly inefficient in software. Gawa field operations are very important in cryptography and underlie a lot of things like the um, authenticated encryption algorithms, which are gaining popularity these days, so things like AES, GCM, which we're starting to see used quite broadly. 
So I've spoken a little bit about the performance, oh, sorry, about the features that we've seen on the accelerators, and now I'd like to look at performance. So this is actually large packet performance, and I'm looking here at um, AES encryption of 8KB objects, and I'm comparing the performance of a single socket Ultraspark T2 processor with a dual socket quad core X64 part. Now, you know, it's fairly obvious here that, you know, having custom hardware for the AES benefits. We get about 40 gigabits per second aggregate AES throughput out of the T2 versus, you know, sub 10 gigabits out of the quad core X64. And it's also nice to illustrate as well that, you know, we can deliver 40 gigabits with about 50% of the CPU idle, so there's plenty of spare compute to actually interpret the results that are being generated. But hey, you know, I mean, this, is, this, is, this is expected. If you go to the effort of putting in custom hardware, you expect some you know, uptick from this. So this is what we'd expect. So now let's focus on small packet performance. And to think about small packets, we have to think about how people go about accessing accelerators in the majority of cases. So the way that people access accelerators generally is via cryptographic frameworks. On Solaris, we have the Solaris cryptographic framework. On Linux and BSD, there's things like the open cryptographic framework. And you know, the frameworks are all implemented as much from a muchness, and I have an illustration of them on the right-hand side here. And basically, if a user application wants to make an offload to the hardware, it calls into the uh, framework's interface library. There's some pre-processing done. The request is then forwarded to the kernel component of the framework is basically an ioctal call via dev, via dev crypto. There's some scheduling, there's some load balancing, the, design, the request is then forward to the device driver. The device driver is the thing that's actually gonna perform the offload to the accelerator itself. So the offload is performed, and then you know, the accelerator performs the processing, and the results percolate back up the application stack. So you can see that you know, we've actually layered quite a bit of software on top of this accelerator, right? There's quite a few different levels, and you know, these software overheads can start to stack up. Now, if you think about why and how frameworks were originally developed, they were sort of developed for use with the off-chip accelerators. You know, so we're focusing there on the longer latency instructions. There's a lot of overheads sort of just generally inherent in an offload. And so this, these overheads are typically sort of noise almost if you're focusing on something like a long-duration RSA operation. And also, a lot of these overheads grow very sublinearly with packet size. And so again, for larger packets, these overheads tend to be um, amortized quite nicely. But if we have these tightly coupled on-chip accelerators and we want to go off to small packet performance, you can find that these overheads do start to add up. And if we're not careful, you end up with a situation where you have a very high-performant accelerator, and it can process you know, very small objects in just a few hundred cycles. But from the application standpoint, this offload could be taking thousands or tens of thousands of cycles to complete. And so something, this is something that needs to be avoided, and this is something we wanted to try and address on the Rainbow Falls processor. And so our observation was, you know, with the classic framework at present, on each and every interaction with the hardware, you traverse that entire software stack. So basically, you've got an ioctal into the kernel, you've got potentially a trap to the hypervisor, and then the results have to percolate back up. But if we add some additional smarts into the accelerator itself, we may need the hypervisor to be involved in some initial configuration of the accelerators. But subsequent to that, there's no reason why the user and the accelerator cannot interact directly. And if we can achieve that, we can cut out a lot of the software stack, and you know, we should boost our performance for small packets very considerably. So, you know, that said, there are a number of challenges associated with doing that, obviously. We're trying to provide user applications with direct access to a shared resource while ensuring security for the user. We're making sure that bad people don't do bad things. We don't want people to have to go and recode or recompile their application to take advantage of this. Existing applications should run essentially unmodified. And we want the API to be sufficiently flexible that it can be used in a wide variety of situations. And really, if you think about it, the user has very limited control over their destiny, right? They can be switched out at any time. They can be moved between cores at any time. Their access to the accelerator could be revoked at any time. And so these are all things that need to be borne in mind as we try to develop this interface. And to compound matters further, a lot of accelerators, including the UltraSpark accelerators, operate on physical addresses. So you have this situation where the accelerator is operating on a physical address, the application's talking virtual addresses. So how do the two communicate? without any opportunity for abuse. 
And then just some final thoughts as well. I mean, obviously, you want to ensure that multi-threaded applications can take advantage of this support. And also, you know, especially in some of the bigger systems, you're going to find that you may have multiple processes that all want concurrent access to the accelerator. So this is something that also needed to be borne in mind. So I'm going to talk now about some of the enhancements that we actually made to the uh, Rainbow Falls accelerator, so our third generation accelerator. And then I'll walk through a simple interaction between the user and the accelerator itself. So as I said, basically, we're going to allow the hypervisor to do some configuration. So it's going to perform the initial mediation between the application and the accelerator. Subsequent to that, correct, performance, correct, oh, excuse me, correct behavior is enforced by the accelerator itself. There's no additional software intervention. So basically, what we do is we've enhanced the hardware such that requests that are generated by a user application are uniquely tagged by the hardware itself to allow the accelerator to authenticate an authorized application. So basically, the accelerator now has the ability to know whether this user's request is an authorized request and its request should be granted and you know, the processing performed, or whether this is an unauthorized user making a sort of spurious request and the request should either be dropped or you know, even the violation reported you know, to the hypervisor and whatnot. So we added that support. We also found that standard address space protections were sufficient to protect the data while it was resident in memory, waiting to be processed. And then finally, the other issue is this VA to PA conversion issue. And one of our major and overriding constraints was that we wanted to minimize the additional area and complexity we introduced going from our second generation to our third generation accelerator. And so to solve this problem, we sort of, you know, we, you know it's sort of a TLB and a budget, if you will. Basically, the hypervisor creates some buffer in memory. It pins that buffer. It provides the um, accelerator with the physical address of that buffer. It provides the uh, application with the virtual address. And now the two can communicate without opportunity for abuse. So essentially, what we did from a hardware standpoint was we augmented the accelerator with um, space to hold the physical address and page size information uh, corresponding to the buffer. We gave it the space to hold the authentication information. So basically, it's an application's process ID and context ID information, which uniquely identifies the application and the system. And then previously, the accelerator was um, only hyperprivileged, so we introduced a, a set of non-privileged commands. So let's now walk through an interaction with the accelerator. So as I said, the first time a user wants to interact with the hardware, it has to go and ask nicely from the OS and the hypervisor. If the hypervisor grants that request, it then, does, it then does the configuration. It provides the accelerator with the authentication information. It creates the buffers. It gives the accelerator the physical address and the page size info for that buffer. And it gives the application the virtual address of the buffer and the virtual address of the control word queue. Subsequent to that, the accelerator and the user can interact directly. There's no reason why we can't expose this API directly to an application itself, and you can basically code to that API. But one of our, um, you know, one of the features we wanted was to ensure that unmodified applications could run. And so it's quite easy to hide this API in the interface libraries that are controlled and implemented by Sun. So we can hide this in our OpenSSL engine or a PKCS 11 library or um, the Java crypto extensions or NSS and things like that. So from that standpoint, we hide the complexity, the new API under the hood. The application sees the standard API, things just get faster. So in this case here, it's um, talking, it makes a request to OpenSSL. OpenSSL copies the data into the pin page. OpenSSL then constructs a control word queue, places it into the user line queue, advances the accelerator's tail pointer. The accelerator starts processing, pulling the data from the pin buffer dumping the results into the pin buffer. OpenSSL can determine the progress and the status of the accelerator using a special load instruction. So basically, interacts synchronously. It just pings the accelerator asking, you know, are you busy? Have you completed? Were there any errors encountered? Uh, did you complete successfully? That type of thing. When it's completed, OpenSSL, OpenSSL copies the data out, and the operation has completed. So what do we obtain from this new interface? Well, previously, if you think about it, there was a lot of overhead associated with doing an offload. We had to go up and down that stack on each and every iteration. 
Now we just have a sort of simple sequence of loads and stores. And so we're seeing, compared to our prior generation of accelerator, about a 30x improvement in small packet performance from the application's perspective. Basically, we're allowing user land applications to obtain close to peak hardware performance for small packet sizes. Previously, we got that for large packet sizes. Now we also provide it for small packet sizes on the Rainbow Falls processor. You may have noticed that we're copying into the small buffer, into the pin buffer. Um, if you choose to integrate directly into your application, you can, with careful buffer placement, eliminate that copy so you can get zero copy. But there's also two additional points to be borne in mind. First of all, we are focusing on small packets such that that copy overhead tends to be fairly small. And secondly, as well, if you think back, and I didn't have time to point it out, but if you looked at the original framework, um, that copy was still there. You had to copy from the user space into a pinned kernel buffer. So it's not an additional copy we've introduced. It's just a copy that, in some cases, hasn't been removed. Um, you can use this interface without having to recode your application. You basically hide the new interface in the interface libraries that are controlled and shipped and provided free of charge by Sun. Um, I'm going to skip over the next two slides. I knew from the start I wasn't going to have time to actually address these, but I just wanted to include them in the slide set for completeness. This talks about Rainbow Falls' support for authenticated encryption algorithms. This talks about our support for um, the Kasumi algorithm. And if you have any questions, please just you know, feel free to ask me offline. The last thing I want to touch on is basically why we decided to go with a discrete accelerator on our CMT processors versus, uh, versus say, um, ISA customization. So on CMT, as you know, we tend to have you know, limited issue with highly shared pipelines. And as a result, cryptographic operations do tend to monopolize those pipelines fairly easily. Now, if we move from a vanilla C implementation down to some you know, custom ISA implementation, we are reducing the pipeline burden but nevertheless, it still tends to be quite a lot of burden on the pipeline. In fact, by moving from a um, ISA implementation down to a, uh, use, the use of a discrete accelerator, we get about a 60x reduction in pipeline utilization. So essentially, we're freeing up the pipelines to be used by the cores in a more effective way. So it's actually a performance play in essence. Also, if you think about it as well, right, if you have to take a cryptographic algorithm and sort of partition it up based on the constraints of your ISA, so register width, number of source operands, you've also got to fit it into timing and pipeline constraints, you're probably going to come up with a less performant implementation than if you have a black box that handles the uh, algorithms from start to finish. And this, again, makes more uh, of a difference at the lower frequency power efficient CMT processes. So again, it's a performance play going with the discrete accelerators. And then also it's a power, there's power benefits as well. Essentially when we perform an AES operation, we only light up the crypto accelerator. If you have ISA support, you light up the entire core. So it's a lot more power efficient to have a discrete on-chip accelerator. And also I mean, you can argue this one, but you know, it makes it easier to minimize cache pollution. Our accelerators feed out of the L2 cache by passing the L1 cache. And so if you're streaming large amounts of data, you don't destroy the other application performance of the applications that are running on the chip. So there's benefits there too. And then finally, um, AES is sort of a poster child in terms of dividing it up to fit into nice user land instructions, nice ISA instructions. If you want to support a variety of cryptographic operations, not all of them cleanly partition into you know, simple instructions as well. So, you know, there's that aspect as well. But, you know, at least from a CMT standpoint, it does make sense from a power and performance perspective to go with a tightly coupled discrete accelerator. And so to summarize, RF continues the UltraSpark CMT tradition of providing on-chip accelerator support. It introduces our third generation accelerator. This accelerator carries forward, as I've said, the support we've seen on the prior two for public keys and bulk ciphers and secure hashes. And we introduce additional ciphers, chaining modes, and additional secure hashes. And also the big, the big innovation, if you will, is the non fast path to the accelerators that basically allows us to eliminate all of the overhead associated with offloading to the accelerators. And we're seeing for small packets and uh, small packet performance improvement of about 30x. We've also provided some non instructions into the ISA to help accelerate authenticated encryption algorithms. 
So really to conclude, I mean, we've seen a lot of successes with the T2 and the T2 crypto support. With Rainbow Falls, we've tweaked it a little bit. We've added some new interfaces. We've got rid of some of the overheads we identified. And I think we can you know, really expand upon that and drive into new application spaces. With that, I conclude. Any questions? Peter Atashian, Naval Postgraduate School down in Monterey. One quick question about uh, having the accelerator and having its own uh, power supply or limiting the power supplies for that system. Um, there have been ways that people have cracked into enterprise systems by monitoring the power supplies and can track the actual AES codes and can get them 100% the first time every time. So has any thought been given to how that portion is designed into these devices? Yeah, I mean, basically, we've spent quite some time um, considering you know, these side channel attacks and so on and so forth. And I think that the power, you know, while we have the power efficiency of not having to power up the full core, the power that's being consumed is largely independent of key sizes and things like this, or the keys that are being utilized. So you can't use that you know, thermal information to actually derive key information. Also, the latency of the ciphers is key independent and things like that. So there's a lot of the potential side channel attacks that hurt software implementations that we're actually immune to on, um, on, with the hardware support. And it's true for the, um, for the RSA side as well. To congratulate you on third generation cryptographic you. acceleration. <laughs> Um, so cryptography is this beautiful thing where we can protect a large number of uh, information by strong encryption and strong hashing. But the ultimate thing is in the protection of the keys. So I was wondering in your third generation um, implementation, what did you do for hardware protection of long-term keys like the private keys of a user? or of you know, any kind of master keys? Because key management yep. is what makes cryptography work or not work. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, we don't have any explicit support in our third generation for securing the keys in terms of be it a hardware key store or something. There are some software optimizations where you can potentially restrict their visibility in the main memory. So, you know, from a securing the key standpoint, the cryptographic boundary has to be somewhat wider, right? Um, it does interact with software key stores and things like that, such that there is some ability to prevent you know, the keys having to sit in the clear in the long term, but nevertheless, they do reside in memory in the clear. So you know, for people who want you know, the secure key store, there still are benefits in the sort of hardened off-chip accelerator approach, you know, the sort of you know, FIPS level three, where you've sort of hardened it or coated it, coated it with epoxy and things like that. So it is something we're aware of, and I think it's you know, maybe something for our fourth generation accelerator. So, so you're saying, you know that um, like BitLocker and so forth, when the, the keys were in plain text in the memory, um, my colleague at Princeton has broken uh, this by uh, freezing the yes. memory and <laughs> doing a cold boot attack. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so one of the key things, I guess, that all of us hardware people should do is protect the keys, even before crypto acceleration. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it is just it is tricky to 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 meet the standards that are laid out by sort of you know FIPS one forty two level three in terms of you know you know protecting the keys in a mainstream server processor, right? Um, you know, if you look at what people do to comply with that in the um, you know off chip accelerators, it, it doesn't really. It's very difficult to translate into a mainstream processor, which admittedly crypto cryptographic performance is a key component of what we wanted to do, but there's a lot of a different you know, application spaces that drive the development of the processor, right? So it's not just a cryptographic processor, you know, it has to do all the different applications. But you know, it is a valid point, and as I said, hopefully it's something we will address in the long term. Thank you. Uh, last question. 
Hi, uh, Eric Sedlar from Oracle. So uh, it seems like this approach could potentially be useful for other off-core resources like uh, communication between uh, software and the GPUs or FPGAs and so forth. And uh, to what extent do you think is this approach going to be generally applicable? And uh, do you think that's something that you guys are going to spend any time on? Um, I mean, not to comment too much about where we're going in the future. I mean, I, th I think it is. I mean, I think that there's you know a lot of beneficial um, you know, from a performance standpoint to try and eliminate some of these overheads, right? And you can start to try and think about using this in different you know accelerable objects, right? So it's not just crypto, as you say. And in fact, you know, there's already things you can potentially use this engine for. So it has a uh, high-speed data movement, right, which you can use for networking and you can use for, um, you know, inter-domain inter communication in the sort of virtualized environment. So um, there's already, you know, uses for this unit that extend outside cryptography. And again, we can start to use this new interface to really sort of allow us to accelerate, you know, a much broader spectrum of packet sizes and things like that. But yeah, I mean, I think that in general, you know, unless you're able to address these software overheads, you really don't see the full benefit of actually moving this device on chip. So I think that, you know, in the future we will, you know, as we start to potentially add additional accelerators and start to broaden the spectrum of things we wish to accelerate on chip, then, you know, some interface along these lines makes sense. Is this only applicable to uh, on-chip accelerators or? I mean, I think you could also do off-chip as well, right? I mean, you know, there tends to be just more overhead there. Um, I focus predominantly on the on-chip, but yeah, you know, I mean, there's the, you know, certainly trying to have a fast path down to hardware is, I think, a laudable goal for any accelerator, right? And you know, it looks like I'm not familiar so much with the sort of the quick path overheads, and you know, Intel has this sort of virtualization layer and stuff, not virtualization, but a standardized interface for offloading to the accelerators and things. And I haven't looked at how much over overhead is there and whether they could employ a similar approach, you know, with potentially additional hardware smarts to try and short circuit some of that. Very good. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you.